next meeting is sir. We are from Pharma and Sir. Okay. We want to have an interaction with you, sir. Okay. Uh, how are you feeling by attending this 59th IPC Varanasi of India, sir? Uh, it's a wonderful place. First time I've ever been to Varanasi, and we've had wonderful tourist things to do. The lectures have been great. I'm looking forward to this afternoon's session, and uh, uh, it's uh, very hot. Okay. I didn't expect it to be this hot. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, we came to know that uh, every year we will maintain that apps uh, exposition and all those things. Okay. Sir. So what is the difference you found between that apps exposition and this 59th IPC? The apps uh, exposition tends to be more analytical oriented equipment, HPLCs, DSCs, things like that. Whereas the exposition here is more mechanical stuff, tablet presses, and a lot of packaging stuff, okay, which you never see at the AAPS meetings. Okay. We don't have the heavy equipment coming in. We have all small stuff, light stuff. But you have some very big equipment there. I was okay. really surprised. So he don't have big equipment to come to see. Yeah, okay. yeah. So being apps president, what are your responsibilities, sir? Uh, be a delegate for the uh, AAPS around the country, around the world, I should say. Okay. I've um, been to China, and Holland, uh, India, um, Brazil, places like that, and um, I've had a lot of travel, but it's mainly you know, trying to uh, tell people what we do, AAPS does, in terms of providing programming and, and symposiums, and workshops to try to increase the level of science at the various countries that we visit. Okay. So what is your comment on the research and development in India? Well, I think research and development in India is growing very, very rapidly, and I'm glad to see that. Uh, I, I, interestingly, as you try to go into the discovery phase, uh, it, people have to be very creative to do discovery, and you have to have very thick skin, because most of the stuff you discover fails. Uh, I worked 30 years with a, an advisor, and, and uh, probably had about 1,000 compounds that we sent into phase one, and we probably have uh, eight drugs that came out of it. So that's a lot of failures, and I'm, I hope that your personalities can deal with the amount of failure you're going to experience. It's not fun. No. Sir, shall you feel that we will have a successful, fruitful result in R&D in the coming future, sir, from India? I think the R&D chemistry part is very strong. Okay, I'm not convinced that R&D pharmacology or biochemistry is there yet. Okay. Uh, that's what we're, we're hoping to find out about as time goes on. Certainly you can make chemicals, you can make dosage forms, and you can produce very uh, inexpensively those products. Yes, it's the biology part. That is, I don't know if it's there yet. Sir, what is your opinion on the manpower of India? Oh, you've got lots of manpower. <laughs> you have lots of manpower. I'm surprised at the numbers. I was amazed when I saw in India, uh, in China, I mean, in terms of uh, manpower. And that's what I'm really about at this meeting, is talking about who's going to educate the scientists of the future. Because we have a, a lot of faculty around the world who are 60 years old who are all going to retire and uh, it's probably 2010 we're going to have a lot of shortages of faculty and 2015 is going to be critical. We're expecting over half the faculty in the United States to be uh, open positions in 2015. Vacancies. Nobody teaching. It really is an issue. Really an issue. Sir, what is the preference you are willing to give for Indians in the U.S.? Preference? In industries or in institutions in that way. Oh, I don't think we give any preference to anybody. Uh, it, it's whoever has the best qualifications okay. are the people that get the job. Uh, in the U.S., we also have the requirement that if you'll bring in a foreign person to take over a position, you have to acknowledge that you're not displacing an American. Right now, with all the downsizing going on in the United States, I believe there's a lot of excess labor force available in the U.S., which is going to adversely affect bringing foreign people into the U.S to do research in the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Sir, what is your opinion on the clinical pharmacy field and the pharmacy practice field? Because in India there is the budding stage. Yes, and I think the United States is still in a budding stage. They keep practicing it with the pharmacists, but the doctors don't believe it yet. Okay. And so this is 20 year experiment going on in the United States, and the doctors still don't get it. So uh, everybody says, well, it'll take another generation. I'm not sure what time another generation means. Is, is it 30 years, another 50 years? I don't know. But certainly they're training them uh, to do this. The majority of the people, however, go out and work retail pharmacy in the United States, which means you work at the corner drugstore, count four, lick and stick. You don't do much in the clinical consulting end of things. There's a very small percentage, about 25% of the students actually go out and work in, hospital, in clinical settings in hospitals. 
75% go out and work in, in retail in the corn drugstore. And they're wasted, they're overeducated and underutilized and very frustrated by that. As evidence the fact they only retain their license for five years after they graduate from college. Sir, nowadays in India, chain farms are going on, sir. So, what is the situation in the US, sir? Do we have any pharmacies like chain pharmacies like that? In India, Apollo pharmacy, like that they are starting in chain pharmacies. Oh, just about all the pharmacies in the United States are chain. Okay. CVS, Walgreens, <laughs> all these things, they're all chain drugstores. Okay. I, it's very, very few independents anymore. Okay. Yeah, the whole thing is going to change. Sir, nowadays, all the uh, abroad countries are companies, multinational companies are targeting India only mainly for outsourcing work. Yep. What is your opinion on that? Uh, just targeting India for outsourcing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I think one of the things we found is that the, the genomics projects is that Indians have a different way of metabolizing drugs than, than say, Germans do or Japanese do. And so we're going to have to do more and more of this sort of uh, pharmacokinetics according to races. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's just cheaper. It just means these are ethnic groups we have to characterize. Okay? Yeah, manpower issue. Um, yeah, I mean, 50 years ago it was revolutionary when we discovered that the Chinese could not metabolize alcohol, and the Germans could. So every time you would do a study that involved alcohol, Japanese would get drunk because they, all, they lack the enzyme to metabolize alcohol. Well, we're seeing that with two drugs now. Different metabolic routes exist with different races, so we have to do that to really understand what's going on with different races and to, to talk towards or to address personalized medication. If you're an Indian and you come into my pharmacy in New Jersey, yes, I still have to think about the fact that you have the Indian genotype enzyme processes for your handling your medication, even though you bought it in America. Okay? So what is your opinion on Indian traditions? Indian traditions? Oh, I really can't comment on that. I don't know. Uh, I mean, traditional medicine. Oh. Yeah, I, I think, you know, herbal medicines were, and pharmacognosy were great sciences a long time ago. And I think, it, and from what we know today, is that the drugs were basically an amorphous state in the plant structure. And if you have a, a plant that's 50 years old, it probably is all degraded, and you're not going to get any significant. Uh, material out of that. And that's what we found with our Chinese herbal medicine collection that we had when I was in Pfizer. Uh, wonderful weeds and seeds, but they're all real old and all the drugs were, well, if there were drugs in there, they certainly had no activity anymore. So I think we have to take a little more aggressive approach to getting currently active uh, plant sources that may have active drugs still in them, as opposed to having it degraded because it's in the amorphous state in the plant structure. Well, sessions? Sessions. Cons con <coughs> what are the suggestions? Advice. Advice. Oh, so thank, you. thank you. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a, it's a gigantic, dynamic world market we're dealing with right now. Uh, I think you're going to see a tremendous growth of the industry here in, in India. And it's going to grow positively if the scientific qualifications of the scientists here are indeed high quality. So it, if you get a, a PhD and a master's or whatever, yes, uh, you're going to be judged in, in this country uh, as, a, as an outsource uh, a vendor is going to be judged by the quality of the work that you can do. Okay. And so I, I think uh, do the best you can, get your qualifications up, and uh, here in India you'll probably see a lot more work coming your way. So on behalf of PharmaInfo.net, I thank very much Dr. James Fais, uh, apps president. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm very glad to have an interaction with you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. So on behalf of PharmaInfo.net, we have a nice interaction and excellent interaction with our apps president, Gina Faces, and I thank for kind presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep.